Good morning, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to our Primordial Qigong webinar. Thank you for signing up, and thank you for uh, receiving all those reminders. I am Josie Weaver, welcoming you now from the Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi, the IIQTC. And so just a couple little things before we start. Some of you are just arriving and just finding your your comfortable place here. So uh, we are going to be going for an hour this morning and uh, there is a question and answer section uh, towards the end of our time here. We also received a lot of questions from you uh, for uh, before as you registered. So many appreciations for that as well. So I just want to give you a little bit of um, uh, a few hints for how to participate here and so some of you are participating through the phone thank you for that and some of you are participating through your computer and the computer is um, going to be an interesting tool to use because at any time you could use your um, control panel that little uh, kind of like a little strip that appears on the right hand side to send us a text question. So if you click on the little section that says questions, you can send us a question at any time. Now I do apologize, the controls are a little bit small. So you know, just uh, if you can magnify your screen, that's wonderful. But you, you do need to kind of read closely onto this thing. The other thing is there's a little orange button that helps you to hide it as well. So hiding the screen or bringing it, um, bringing it up and then finally there's a little icon it looks like a little hand if you click on that that will raise your hand and get get us um, attention here uh, for the show okay and um, so right now you're seeing um, uh, the screen right uh, that's showing um, looks like our Facebook page here so anyway just in a moment we'll be starting and so um, let's see uh, okay let's see so in a, we'll be starting and so if you want to send us a question you can raise your hand and um, we'll call on you and if you've got a headset you can speak into the conference space and that'll just be really lovely that's a great way to participate and to um, just be part of the part of the chi here of the the moment Okay, so uh, a nice deep breath together here. And we are now ready to introduce our presenter for this morning. Our presenter is the director and founder of the Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi. And as you know, as some of you know or may not know, the Institute itself has been alive and well for the last 12 years. And the exciting thing is that the 12 years really is, is completing a cycle of growth and challenge and wonder and uh, awe and a sense of anticipation for the future. So with us today is somebody who has not only uh, founded the Institute but directs the Institute very actively, training teachers and running workshops through many, many venues someone who's been doing this wonderful work for over 40 years as a practitioner, as a teacher, as an acupuncturist, as a researcher who has been invited to do many keynotes including the Mind Body Week in uh, Washington DC last year with the likes of Herbert Benson. So with that I would like to invite and welcome Dr. Roger Yanka. Welcome Roger. Thank you, Josie, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, taking the time to join us here today. And um, I got caught on the good morning, everyone, because I'm thinking maybe it's after morning if you're out east, and it's probably later in the day if you're in Europe. And so, thank you for taking this part of whatever day of whatever part of the day you are in. The um, <clears throat> Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi was founded uh, 
on the idea uh, in the year 2000 on the idea that the new millennium would be uh, the time when Qigong and the power of Qigong and all of the amazing benefits of Qigong, the wonderful mystery of Qigong and the powerful, powerful promise of Qigong could make its way into our society in Europe and America. And uh, that is happening, and it's happening in a very big way, and it's extremely exciting, and uh, the credibility of the uh, Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi has been consistently growing due to the fact that we have a powerful teacher training curriculum and that we have done research. I have published some books through major publishing companies. And so it's an exciting time, and the opportunities to uh, maximize the ability for people in the Western world to have access to the amazing information and practice of Qigong is accelerating. Uh, here at the Institute, we train teachers as well as the public and um, we're very uh, excited about the fact that we are now to the, the Year of the Dragon. When we founded the Institute in uh, the year 2000, which was actually several years after we began being, uh, training teachers, uh, it was the Year of the Dragon then. So it was the Year of the metal dragon or the golden dragon, and now it's the year of the water dragon. And of course, the dragon is this powerful, powerful animal that is sort of legendary as opposed to actual, uh, which is a, an amazing thing in itself. If you look at the Chinese tradition, and many of you have been to a Chinese restaurant and gotten a fortune cookie with something in it about your, you know, birthday being associated with the, any number of animals, horses and cows and pigs. The dragon is the only one that has that transcendental nature. And in fact, it's this year is the portal to the non-ordinary, meaning dragons that fly. The dragon, by the way, is the representative of the primordial, which is what primordial qigong is all about and what we're going to be talking about today. And primordial qigong is a method that opens a portal to the non-usual, meaning the, tr you know, the transpersonal aspect of our being, the quantum, and this is all described in Chinese language by the word wuji. And so after these 12 years, we've been waiting, actually, to, to work with the primordial until enough of our graduates from our training program, for our teacher training program, had made their way through some serious cultivation of the energy matrix, that is the the body energy or the energy body, or the natural energy of our being that takes on a body, which we will be discussing here in a little while. And so the the whole concept of primordial qigong is um, it's kind of like an advanced form of qigong, but what's really interesting about the nature of Qigong is that advanced doesn't mean complex necessarily, and advanced does not mean esoteric. What advanced means is uh, the ability on the part of the practitioner to uh, basically settle down and notice what's actually happening within their own being. And that doesn't necessarily mean to have to work harder or learn more. It means more can you 
how shall we say, get out of the complexity of your life. And of course, part of why we're talking about primordial these days is that we're going to be doing a, uh, a retreat, a powerful retreat, where you will learn the primordial Qigong method, as well as be with people of like values and, and shared mind. And um, so it will be a, an amazing retreat. And it's based on the whole concept of the primordial is based on not, not just the power of circles. It's the power of circles is how the primordial uh, is initiated as a practice. And by initiating a practice that's especially associated with the power of circles, that takes us into an association with the circles that we are surrounded by, the circles that are within us. And this image here of the powerful, powerful circle of the sun having in its, its influence on the, on the planet Earth where we dwell. And then the circles associated with the magnetic field around the planet. It's kind of like the primordial practice takes us from our ordinary state into a non-ordinary state which then exposes us to the essential nature of our own being as well as the essential nature of the, well, the cosmos. Now, before we get further in to this exploration of circles, uh, allow me to just create a context for you that is, um, shall we say, uh, pointing in the direction of how the primordial practice fits into the overall medical theory of the ancient Chinese and really all indigenous cultures. So that would include any kind of shamanic uh, medicine based on a shamanic foundation or a background. And here in the Western world, our medical system is based on healing disease. And uh, you want that. You want to be able to accomplish that. And, of course, we spend or maybe even waste a lot of money treating diseases that are completely preventable, and that's extremely tragic. And, of course, any kind of an event where you or are learning how to be more well is going to be you making a contribution to the society because every disease that you don't have, every doctor visit you don't need, every drug you don't take is uh, a part of solving the health cost problem. And of course, if you prevent a disease, then uh, nobody has to pay whether you're paying for it yourself or your company that you work for is paying it or the uh, government is paying it through the Medicare system. However, the payment is happening if you don't need the doctor visit, the drug, the surgery, then that's, that money is saved and we can spend it on improving our schools, our roadways, uh, rebuilding bridges that are falling down, and so forth. So uh, the beauty of the ancient system of medicine is that it's not based on healing disease. It's based on maximizing well-being. And in fact, and that would be the preference for our healthcare system too, and within the system of maximizing well-being is another even more uh, entertaining and intriguing system, which is the process of prevention and wellness that leads to extended well-being throughout a longer life. In other words, people live in a vital sort of way in a, long, in a longer period of time and therefore they contribute more to, to the society. They become more wise. And so then the older people in our lives are the wisdom keepers as opposed to uh, people who are not well and not feeling well and not really even that happy being alive. And so as you can see, this is a kind of a nesting that the heal disease part is the least 
important and the least necessary and the least interesting and, and the most expensive and the maximize well-being portion of this is much more interesting because we're talking about being well and uh, who doesn't want to be well. And then longevity is about extending wellness. And we're not talking about the kind of longevity that's created by taking drugs uh, and, and not even being able to um, remember who you are or what, what you're doing. I mean, in other words, being alive but not being well. We're not talking about the kind of longevity wherein someone is alive but not well. We're talking about longevity wherein someone is alive and vital and well and contributing. And then what does this next one mean? This is so interesting, immortality. So if, if, the, whole lay, if, if, the, if the system of medicine is based on layers and the, the ultimate layer is the concept of immortality, what does that mean? Well, in the cultures that use the word immortality freely, um, particularly the ancient cultures, and an immortal is not a person who lives forever in the body that they have now. They are a person who is aware of the fact that they have an aspect of their being that lives forever. So immortality medicine, if you want to call it that, is accessing and expressing the etern our eternal nature. And if one is in the process of understanding their natural immortality and then cultivating that, as is made possible by most any form of Qigong, but especially forms of Qigong like primordial Qigong that have the unique qualities that we'll be talking about soon, then longevity happens spontaneously. Maximized well-being happens spontaneously. And the need to heal disease is reduced immensely. And healing of disease also happens spontaneously. So the idea is that for anyone who wants to be a part of the solution for healthcare in their own life and for the nation that they live in, and for anyone who um, is inclined to pursue the most uh, refined expression of their own being, and for anyone who is fascinated with and committed to the, the aspect, to, to cultivating the aspect of themselves, which is eternal and uh, cannot be harmed, then all the other aspects of medicine spontaneously arise from that, longevity, well-being, and healing disease. And so the question becomes, why would I ever do anything less than cultivate my eternal self? And because by doing so, I have the uh, natural capacity to accomplish longevity, and I mean healthy longevity, maximized well-being and the prevention of disease. What a powerful and fascinating process. And so let's talk about how this can, can happen. Uh, I use the word cosmic here. Uh, it, it, it's not particularly necessary. You could just think of it as your own energetics. But because of the fact that the Chinese medicine is based on understanding the nature of the universe and the cosmos, and even some higher ideals uh, about the fact that there may be more than one cosmos, uh, a multiplicity of cosmoses, if you can say it that way. And um, these are all things that are very impossible for us to know too much about because of the fact that quantum physics doesn't use telescopes or microscopes. It, it uses mathematics to predict what the experience of this world could be in addition to what we, that we actually experience with our sensory system. And the whole concept of the multiplicity of, of dimensions and so forth gets into that. And because we're mostly interested in our own well-being and our own peace of mind and our own stress management and in, our, in, in healing disease or preventing disease, let's just talk about this from the perspective of how the oneness that is the circle at the top, 
uh, becomes the two, which is the circle at the bottom. And uh, by the way, if you don't know this already, you, you'll, be, you'll be fascinated to, to know that the word Tai Chi isn't a word that means an exercise. The word Tai Chi means this second circle with the two flowing, uh, sometimes people call it fish, sometimes people call it the paisley, sometimes people call it a water drop or a teardrop. But the, the dark and the light, the yin and the yang in association. Now the thing that's important about this for us to understand, just kind of, you know, for the fun of it, for this conversation, is to say that the what we recognize through science as the Big Bang, when the world take, took on the nature that it that, that it has that we experience, the moment you know when the the voice of the absolute said, "Let there be light," and suddenly the uh, the eternal what appears to be kind of like an eternal still stillness jumped into motion, and, and that eternal darkness uh, allowed for the entree of light, a very powerful and mythic moment in the history of the world that we live in, in our own world. Um, if there wasn't for the Big Bang, there wouldn't be uh, a world that you could live in. There wouldn't be water and there wouldn't be fire. There would only be that empty circle at the top that even physicists have a hard time describing and understanding. And this is the process of how physics works from the point of view of uh, most indigenous people. And this is from the perspective of the Chinese with the idea of wuji, which is the kind of qigong that we're talking about here, and taiji, which is uh, any kind of qigong that expresses um, Hmm. It's hard to put a word there, right? Because we're talking about over there on the right where it says mutuality of opposites. So we'll just leave it at that. Dark, light, up, down, right, left, in, out, on, off, hot, cold, wet, dry, empty, full, etc. And this is the foundation of Chinese medicine, of course. And how the physics continues to, to descend is after the two comes the three, which is the three treasures, the body, the chi and mind, and the spirit. And then the next one is the four di directions, which is, which is also to a certain extent associated with the four dimensions, the north, south, east, west, etc., and also associated with the three dimensions of space, up, down, right, left, uh, and back to front, and then time. And then the five elements, of course, is one of many different kinds of Chinese medicine. And then all of that descends into the multiplicity or the 10,000 things. So it goes from the, the oneness to the Taiji two-ness to the Sun Bao three-ness to the four directions, fourness, to the wuxing, five elements, fiveness, and then that's the manifestation of everything. Your, uh, you know, your car keys, uh, your uh, the remote that you use to switch your television, your toothbrush, your bills in the mailbox, um, people that you know, you know, those are the ten thousand things, and it's also a uh, description of how the uh, spiritual nature uh, finds its way into first consciousness, personal consciousness, and then into flesh. And so the, the material paradigm, the one that we live with in the Western world, is that the body may possibly have an energy and a spirit. But science uh, is not comfortable with this as of yet, and so this is a big question mark. It's not, and we know, although there is good science on energy, uh, ions in the body, the magnetic field of the human system, 
the how th these things work, ions and the magnetic field. And also then we understand the quantum, although what that means is that we know about the quantum and the people who are quantum physicists can talk about the quantum. But in terms of actually being able to articulate the quantum in terms that we understand very well, it's we're not there yet in our science. Whereas as an alternative, the transphysical paradigm, and that would be the paradigm of Chinese medicine because it's based on qi and uh, any other uh, indigenous or ancient medical system that allows for uh, any sort of uh, what, what we would call mysterious activities that are not well understood by science, like soul, uh, you know, recollecting the soul in shamanic uh, medicine and healing, uh, the prana of the of the uh, of India, and all of the different forms of energy of all the different cultures, uh, the manna of the Hawaiians, and the uh, the trembling energy of the African shamans, and 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 so forth. And and this is the chi has many names, of course. And so we're talking about making contact with the natural connection between our local self and our uh, spiritual or universal or quantum self. And so moving on, this relation, this concept of working with circles and spirals and spheres that have to do with making contact with the aspect of ourself which is eternally well and making making contact with the aspect of ourself that cannot die and making contact with the with the aspect of ourself that um, is goes beyond the nature of the world as we see it the the right left up down front back time kind of goes to the post einstein version of things which isn't it interesting that uh, practitioners and masters and wizards of Qigong uh, were able to make contact with the quantum nature uh, thousands of years ago. And here in our own society, we have not yet been able to accomplish this. It's striking. And so there is the presence of, uh, a, there is the presence of a purposefully refined consciousness which produces a profound medicine within us. It's not a pill. You don't go to a drugstore to get it. It's a medicine that is produced within you. And at the level of alchemy and the trans, transnormal or transusual, this medicine is called the elixir of immortality, meaning that we can make contact with the aspect of ourself which is eternal and then refine ourselves on purpose to produce a medicine that is a higher level of medicine than a medicine for the body and even higher than a medicine for the consciousness or the mind. It is a medicine that is uh, an, a, an expression of our totality or our absolute nature which then we allow to have an influence on our body and our emotional self. The primordial Qigong's spiral practice is one of the methods developed by the ancient to produce the most profound medicine. And the roots of this, uh, and we'll of course spend a little more time on this when we get together at the retreat, is that Lao Tzu, the great uh, author of the Tao Te Ching, in uh, five, four to five hundred years before the, the common era, in the mythological Zhou dynasty, and then later Lu Dongbin, from uh, who's a, a great, and many others, of course, were were, were uh, involved in this throughout the centuries. I just mention these two names. Uh, both great alchemists from the point of view wherein alchemy means to produce the golden elixir within one's own being 
on purpose with intent through a practice like primordial qigong. Both of these individuals suggest that health, vitality, and well-being are not as efficiently cultivated by addressing the body only, but rather by cultivating one's heavenly nature. Or another way to say this is they're suggesting that you refine the universe within. And of course, you may have been exposed to this idea of as above, so below, microcosm, I'm sorry, macrocosm uh, in association with microcosm, with your own being as being a, a, a potentially a quantum boundless being that has taken on a body and the personality has forgotten its universal or cosmic connection and through the process of Qigong and Wuji Qigong and many, many other forms of Qigong create this potential for us to literally cultivate or refine the our own inner universe, which is a then reflection of the macrocosmic universe of the world. And this is accomplished not so much by doing a practice to make something happen. And, and this is a point that I want to hang on for just a moment. When you've practiced Qigong in the past, whether you have or haven't, or when you practice Qigong in the future, if it looks and feels like what you're doing is trying to make something happen, that's very different than, so let me read this again, accomplished not so much by doing the practice to make something happen, but rather by not doing on purpose, thus cultivating the capacity to be aware of what naturally occurs. So in the practice, we're not looking so much to make something happen, we're looking instead to get out of the way, be less tense, be less concerned, be less focused on the things that our personality is focused on, turn our attention to the oneness, and then be ultra aware, radically awake to that which is actually occurring within us at a deeper level than we usually attend to. So this retreat that we're looking at <clears throat> is uh, going to be an amazing event, of course. It's happening in a beautiful place. We'll talk about that in just a few moments. What a relief. We're not going to a retreat to figure out what to do, uh, although certainly there will be something to do. But in a at a retreat like this, it's really so much more about finding your way into the um, space or the state of not doing. What a relief. There is not much to do. In the act of not doing, much is accomplished. And this is a classic reflection on a classic line from Lao Tzu. In the context of the usual, something is added. In the rarefied context of the non-usual, something is stopped through conscious intent. In other words, instead of taking on much in a retreat like this, something is dropped. Daily, something is dropped. Moment, moment to moment, something is dropped. And examples of things that can be dropped are false assumptions that we held to be dear and realized weren't true, exhausting habits, uh, being under the influence of, of, of people's opinions about who we should be and what we should be. This can happen through your family or otherwise. So I think you know what I mean uh, by dropping. This makes the, profound, the most profound medicine, the golden elixir, sometimes called the golden elixir of immortality within our own being. Making the gold, golden elixir, or actually discovering the golden elixir because it's already there, is a process of, uh, that can happen through Qigong practices like uh, primordial or Wuji Qigong. It is an alchemical process wherein the naturally present golden 
aspect of your nature, the highest reflection of your being, isn't somewhere. It's actually within us. And through this process, we produce a medicine, an elixir, which supports us in expressing our natural eternal wellness, as well as our natural eternal creativity. And in fact, the power of these practices can help us to make changes in our lives that we may have been postponing, uh, which is extremely powerful. Uh, it was my great fortune to meet Dr. Chu Hui. Lao Shi means honored teacher. So Chu Hui Lao Shi means uh, his name then with the words honored teacher. And he is the one that uh, taught me primordial Qigong. And uh, I'm, I've written about Zhu uh, Hui uh, in the Healing Promise of Qi, some of the nine phases from the Healing Promise of Qi are attributed to the primordial practice. And uh, it's just an extraordinary person. And I'm uh, actually writing about Zhu Hui right now. And uh, when we get to the retreat, that writing could possibly be, um, shall we say, uh, more complete than I can show you, you know, maybe give you access to some of that. Uh, but the most important thing is the practice itself. And one of the things that Zhu Hui always said was that, just like Lao Tzu, it's not about gaining a whole lot. It's, it's, a, it's much, much more about letting go of a whole lot. Over time, at your own pace. And of course, being in a retreat-like environment with good friends is just a very powerful way to do it. So I'm going to speed up a little bit because of time. Uh, here are a couple of images from the Healing Promise of Chi uh, that reflect on some of how uh, some of the postures that show up in the primordial Qigong. And primordial Qigong is a, a, creates a, it takes us to a portal or helps us to create a portal between our normal lives that we experience through our sensory uh, self um, to uh, a domain that's actually present. It's already present, uh, but we just don't pay that much attention to it. And all of these circles here are a part of how this all works. And, and we're not going to go too much into the uh, details of the primordial practice right this moment. But um, notice, for instance, with the upper right-hand corner, the black and white one, if you start at the smallest portion of the black up at the number 44. And then you go further, it gets more and more black until you get to the one at the bottom. And then it starts to get smaller. Now, doesn't that look a little bit like a dragon to you? And so this whole concept of the energy at the highest level of consideration and um, doing some practices that are associated with these very, very um, highly refined uh, awarenesses creates the dragon within. It's the flying, transcendental aspect of your nature, which is not limited in any way to any dimension. And so in Taoism, of course, there are all these practices for traveling, uh, both deeply within ourselves and into the, what we believe to be the apparent external world. That's, you know, it's just fascinating. And uh, this bottom right is the one that shows how the uh, primordial practice goes both to the left and the right, and it's very, very unique. You, you'll just chuckle when you learn this practice, uh, the, the beauty of how it, at the same time as you're going to the right, you go to the left. And I'll just have to leave it at that because it's, it's hard to articulate how it works. You just have to, uh, you know, practice the practice, learn how to do the practice. It's fairly simple. It will not take anywhere near five days. So what we're going to be doing is learning that practice and then using it. 
to get into this, uh, to the Wuji or primordial domain. More about how circles and cycles make medicine. And uh, the slides here are not that good, but uh, the point is that the directions have something to do with this, of course. Um, every culture has uh, the power of the direction. So what we're really talking about is the medicine wheel. And notice the one below about how the, 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 the kind of mesmerizing effect of having these uh, directionalities go at, in two different directions. And a, a lot of how the uh, Wuji practice works is supports us to, to coming up right up into our primordial nature uh, using a practice that's based on circles. So this retreat, at this retreat, we will be uh, learning what's called the Qigong Medicine Wheel, also known as the uh, Taoist Medicine Wheel, which has to do with penetrating nature's secrets, using the directions and so forth to uh, reflect uh, the secret of the nature as we see it. And then Wu Qi, Qigong goes beyond that, takes us to the, uh, the what's called what I would call the primordial gateway, which takes takes us into the very non-usual world of Wuji, which has to do with exposing ourselves to the aspect of ourself which is uh, eternally well and cannot be harmed. And then we will practice some of the practices from the Secret of the Golden Flower, which is really the collection of primordial or Wuji or alchemy knowledge. Um, uh, after thousands and thousands of years, uh, the Chinese began to think about these things as much as five to 10,000 years ago. But they were actually in the process of building their way to this understanding 20 to 30 to 50,000 years ago. And the secret of the golden flower is basically, basically the distillation of all that knowledge as it came forward and was refined more and more over time. And so we will uh, uh, explore Wuji from the perspective of the secret of the golden flower. These three practices merge to give both movement in stillness and stillness in movement, a total practice for spirit, mind, and body. And of course, this when you look at the uh, uh, at the uh, registration page for this event, you will find your uh, some pictures there of the retreat center. The uh, Casa de Maria is a retreat center that has been used by the Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh and uh, Jean Houston. It just so happens it's right here in the same town as the uh, Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi. And uh, we have had many events there. And unlike some of the retreat centers that we've been to, this particular retreat center is very attentive because of the fact that they deal with these um, really highly refined uh, individuals who bring their groups of people to study there. Uh, we've done some of our teacher trainings there and so forth. It's right at the foothills of the Santa Barbara Mountains. Uh, it's not a very far drive from the ocean. And um, it's right in Oprah's neighborhood. So we we may see Oprah out on her walk. And um, the, uh, oh, and there's one more thing. And there is a tree there that is the largest. It's a, it, I think it may be the largest tree I've ever seen. Uh, the trunk of this tree is it's a eucalyptus tree, and I think maybe four to five people could stand around it holding hands um, and, you know, maybe be touching. So it's, a, it's just a magical, magical place to have uh, an opportunity to engage in our primordial nature. So I am looking forward to meeting you. We'll do some uh, questions uh, now. Uh, Josie, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to meeting you all and um, looking forward to seeing you there. 
Thank you, Roger. That's really always wonderful to experience the information that you're imparting. Feeling a lot of gratitude right now. So we are moving on to questions and answers. And some of you have been sending us some questions during the event. Thank you so much for that. And um, some of you also experienced some audio problems, so I apologize for that. Um, we try to address those as, as much as possible. So um, just in the future, it seems that cell phones um, interrupt the signal. So just be sure that that's not on. OK, so we are moving to Q&A. And uh, in a moment, we can start here with that. So let's, um, let's go ahead and start with the first question coming from someone named David. Thank you, David, for this question. Uh, the question is, how best to do absent or remote healing? All right, so repeating the question, mm. how best to do absent or remote healing? Ah, uh, yes, David, thank you very much. Well, these, uh, this, this is a, such a big question and, and one that has a multitude of answers. And if you go online and look up those words, uh, you'll see that it's, a, it's an absolute, uh, uh, just a phantasmagoria of uh, amazing ideas about how this all happens. So one of the ways to answer the question is to say my preference for F absence healing, because otherwise it's just, it's just, uh, it's, it's just um, opinions, right? In other words, these concepts of being able to have an influence on another person are uh, come from all sorts of different, um, shall we say, traditions. And uh, as a student of these things, going back to myself being uh, involved with Edgar Cayce and the Edgar Cayce Foundation, which is called the Association for Research and Enlightenment, all the way back in the, in the very early 60s. And then um, having been uh, initiated by the Maharishi into transcendental meditation pretty much right around the time that the Beatles were and at the same time as Dr. Herbert Benson from Harvard began his research on meditation. And um, uh, that was an amazing part of that whole process of understanding the nature of healing. So, and then of course then to get involved in Chinese medicine and Qigong and the quantum aspect of Qigong, which is the non, the boundless, timeless, non-dual, oneness, unity aspect. And so when we train people to do distant healing, we do so in a context where the only thing that we're doing, and, and you'll find this maybe even uh, like, wow, how, how, how does that have anything to do with anything? But by getting into the state of oneness and then holding an individual, any individual, in one's consciousness, that's it. So in other words, getting into the state of oneness and then associating that with a person. And what that does, or might be doing, or could be doing, is that um, for some reason a person who's not well is uh, expressing a uh, separation from their natural state of eternal wellness. Now, it's true that people come and go in their bodies. And so there are times when a person is unwell and they're just simply in the process of disassociating from the body that they've been dwelling in. And there are other times when a person is unwell and they're disassociating from their natural wellness in a context where there's the potential for them to recover their well-being. And so it's a pretty darn tricky issue to put yourself in the business of trying to fix a person who is actually in the process 
of fulfilling on their natural destiny. And so um, I'm, I'm not going to be, I, I don't really feel comfortable suggesting that, you know, anyone on the phone or anyone in the world would go into the business of being a, shall we say, healer who is um, going to uh, help people to heal themselves uh, without somehow knowing that that person is destined to be healed. Now, there's a lot of disempowerment that happens in the, shall we say, healing business, where people get healed by others and then live the rest of their life never knowing that they could have healed themselves. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not being more cooperative, I, I guess we could say, around the subject of, of, of distant healing. Because I want to be sure that we separate the whole issue of doing distant healing as something that, you know, nobody else can do, and doing distant healing in a context that everybody can do it. And which reminds me of a, a quote from Einstein, which says, uh, you can either live your life as if there are no miracles, or you can live your life as if everything's a miracle. And if you're a person who lives your life in a context where you believe that everything is a miracle, then access to the whole context of distant healing or oneness recognition or returning to the natural eternal state is very much within reach. And then last thing to say is that when one gets into the primordial uh, state, shall we say, into the into the radical awareness of the um, of the uh, state of unity in the universe, where everything is completely connected, then spontaneous arising of healing in oneself and in others can occur simply because of the fact that we're doing the thing that I said in the beginning, getting into the ultra aware of the oneness state and then holding someone that we know or someone who's requested that we do so in mind and associating them with their own eternal well-being. That would be my best answer for that. Along version of something that could have been stated very, very briefly. Josie. Yes. Okay. Yes. So you okay. see the nature of some of these questions. The nature of some of these questions. Um, are, are such, right? <laughs> so we have easy questions and hard questions. Which one would you like next, Roger? Uh, well, give me an easy one and then we'll go for a hard one. <laughs> Okay, here's an easy one. This is from, um, let's see, it looks like Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Um, is your system for primordial Qigong a traditional lineage, a standard Qigong, or a system that you developed? And so follow, you know, so there's oh, actually a couple questions in here, but so is your system a traditional lineage, yeah. a standardized Qigong, or a system that you developed? Well, I like this question because it, it allows for a lot of uh, a teaching to happen in a very brief period of time here. And by the way, any time that I would come forward with an answer to any question, I want everybody to know that I know, and I want you to know as well, that it's just an opinion, a, an opinion based on someone who's interested in these things for a really long time. I've been to China eight times. I've had a 30 years practice in Chinese medicine as a, as a clinician and a big part of that time as a chief of staff of an of a integrative medicine clinic. And so you could say that maybe this is an educated guess or, or some information from someone who, you know, has put some time, effort, and attention into these things. Uh, primordial, the word wuji, in Chinese, or the character for Wuji in Chinese, is translated in the Western world to mean primordial or, or 
um, non-dual. Non-dual meaning that there's no separation of anything. It's all a oneness. And so there are, just like there are many forms of Tai Chi, which is an expression of the nature of things following the Big Bang, uh, there are many forms of Qigong based on the concept of Wuji, which is the, uh, the, the state of things previous to the Big Bang. And I don't want to say state, I want to say dynamic, because these are all very, very uh, dynamic uh, states. So the Wuji Qigong, or the primordial Qigong, that we will be using at this retreat uh, comes from a lineage. However, the individual that I uh, learned this from, and that really any of the people who are here in the Western world who are using this particular form learned it from, because it came down a very thin pathway uh, from uh, a, a school of Taoism. Um, there are other forms of Wuji, and including the standing posture. When you stand in what's called um, uh, Yi Chuan, Yi Chuan, which is standing posture, uh, it's also a form of Wuji, which is where the body is still and so forth. And there are other forms of Qigong by highly revered uh, individuals. And so it's important to understand that there are many forms of Qigong, of, of Wuji Qigong, that this particular form comes through a Taoist lineage associated with uh, Wudan, uh, Wudan Mountain. And a particular person who apparently was, uh, shall we say, the keeper of this lineage passed it to uh, Zhu Hui. And as we understand it, um, that person did not pass this on to many people because those of us who study Qigong uh, very thoroughly and have been to China many times and have talked to many people have not seen this form. And of course, that's what happened during the communist period in the Cultural Revolution is a lot of these things had to go underground and apparently Zhu Hui had the qualities that this particular monk, uh, Li Tong, uh, was interested in, and so he passed it on. And then, because of the nature of things, everyone has a filter through which they learn and through which they teach. And it's, it's usually based on sincerity. So in other words, the filter, sometimes when we use the word filter, it sounds like a bad word. But um, it's just that any individual has their natural self in combination with their, their, their characterological self. And the relationship between the characterological self and the, and the natural transcendental self is, you know, that they're different. And, and usually when we're teaching and learning, we're learning with the filter of our character in place. And so it's impossible for uh, Li Tong to not have made some sorts of, uh, shall we say, natural contributions to the primordial Wuji form. And for, uh, uh, for Zhu Hui to have contributed to, uh, through his own filters and his own learning. Because after all, when you get into the Wuji state, you are taking on um, massive amounts of uh, information from your highest self, and then being able to, you know, resolve that through your personality. And so, uh, when we when we're at the uh, retreat, we'll go into this more because, wow, the um, the um, I, I want to say the story. No story is no good. The theory. Oh well, theory is fine. Philosophy. You know, when you get up towards Wuji, you can't use words anymore. That's when. Lao Tzu said, if you can talk about it, it's not it. Uh, so we're trying to talk about something that can't be discussed. Then finally, Bruce, the last part of your question was, you know, was this in, somehow influenced by me? And, um, you know, absolutely. The interface between myself and 
Chu Hui, very powerful. I mean, I, I actually studied with this person many, uh, many months on end uh, in China. Now, there are others who have taken up this form who only met him very briefly for a weekend or, or even briefer. And this is not to say that they couldn't have had a, 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 a bona fide experience and, and learned a lot about the Wuji practice. Um, but, you know, I, I'm just saying that I, I had the honor and the opportunity to spend quite a bit of time with Zhu Hui. And we had, because I was leading groups to China to study with him, we had many, many late hours together. So I'll tell you one thing that uh, um, I can say very briefly is that uh, uh, Zhu Hui said one night, when I handed him a document that was written in Chinese, that had also an uh, English translation with it that I had been reading. And it is a traditional uh, text. Uh, which, you know, has a just a fantastic long name that nobody would understand because it's kind of about these things. And he read it, and I, he chuckled, he smiled. I could see that he was delighted that the that this document had come into the hands of a person who does not speak Chinese and did not live in China, and that it was you know translated into English, which he could not read or didn't care to read. But the most poignant moment was that when he handed it back to me, he gave me a little bow and he said, you know more than I do. And it really stopped me, stunned me, got me. And, um, and, uh, and then we went on. We had tea and chuckled about other things, talked about the lesson for tomorrow. You know, I tried to get the translator to, um, he had a little English, not a lot, so we had to talk through a translator to accomplish this. And he just basically smiled. And I think that it was one of those moments when the teacher says, you know, if I answer this question for you, it'll be the biggest mistake that I ever made in your life. And so I'm not going to answer this question. I'm going to let this question live in you for the rest of your life. And so I think what he was saying is that all this language and blah, blah, blah that you handed me in this text, it's gorgeous, it's beautiful tradition, but it doesn't have much to do with being. You know, and then we went, went, then we went on. And so asking, to a certain extent, the question, does this come from a lineage? Yes. But does that matter? Well, I'm not sure. Um, you know, have you, Roger, had any sort of input on this whatsoever? Well, yes, because the words will be coming out of my mouth, and we're going to be at a retreat that was established by me and my, my colleagues, who I appreciate so much. And so it's almost like you can't ask this kind of question and get any kind of a straight answer. But I can promise you this, that when you take on any form of Qigong and use it with sincerity, the, everything about the lineage and the person that you talk to to get the information falls away. There's nothing left but the practice itself and you in it. And so if one is practicing in such a way that brings them into a deep, 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 deep awareness of their true nature, then that's that. And if the person is practicing in such a way that they are distracted or not clear or questioning or doubting, either doubting the source or doubting themselves, then then that's that. And so it's are we are we are we having the experience of being in the practice or are we having the experience of something else? That's really the bottom line.
So let's leave it there. And thank you, Bruce. I was, uh, I think this could possibly be the Bruce I'm thinking of, and, and <laughs> thanks for being here. Yeah, and thank you for the thorough answer in the the meditation, right? The, you know, this is a the answer to the question that leads to more questions and more thinking and I, you know always appreciated okay I am gonna play timekeeper here and notice that we are over time and appreciate everyone for staying on a little bit longer we have one more well, was slide that the easy question or, yeah okay. <laughs> I just want to know is that the easy, That's question easy or the one question? you know what I I wasn't sure you know I you know, I saw the bunch of questions and I asked the next one so you know there we go. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, so... Uh, we will be, by the way, the people are here, you know, we will be in an ongoing conversation with you if you're inclined to that. So, in other words, if we haven't spoken before, um, I look forward to somehow getting to know you better. So, please check into our websites, and um, we will have uh, webinars, you know, here and there going forward. So, let's, um, let's get together at some point, and until then... Let's meet here. Yes. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, and so just to conclude, I uh, want to just remind everyone that the Alchemy Primordial Qigong Retreat is June 8th through the 13th. And watch your mailbox for um, special um, information regarding Primordial Qigong, Alchemy, and this retreat in particular. And so uh, your follow-up email will contain information on how to register if you're interested or if, if it's not a good time for you, uh, you can definitely still participate and ask questions. Tomorrow's another webinar, uh, as they say. It's uh, going to be Saturday, same time, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So I hope to see you there. I also want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available in probably a little bit over 24 hours. Seems like it's 36 hours these days to get that going. And so look for that in your uh, mailbox and your email as well. All right, appreciating you all for hanging in there a few minutes longer. And um, so wanting to say goodbye and also handing it over to Roger for a 30 second goodbye. Mm, thank you, Josie. Well, first of all, just be sure to, as soon as you get the link for uh, your uh, access to the registration page, you can go to that page and get lots of information and, you know, register either right away or not. Definitely look into this deeply. Feel, sure, feel free to send us uh, questions, which we will try to answer, you know, about anything um, practical about the, uh, the event itself. And then uh, in the last 15 seconds, I would say, um, you know, we're on the brink. I think the human race is 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 really ready for its next level of actual evolution. You know, we believe that evolution has something to do with the amazing cell phones and groovy televisions that we can watch these days and wave our hands in front of and so forth. But what what I'm talking about is the human beings themselves evolving to the point where we've gotten over the competitive nature that leads to harming each other and using uh, products on our food that, that aren't real food and, uh, you know, doing things to the seeds that make them into something else that's harder to digest. You know, all of that is really getting, um, well, boring. If it's not scary, it's boring. And I think that the revolution in human consciousness that is trying to happen is definitely happening in the Qigong community. And that is just so exciting. And so we're looking forward to knowing you better. Thank you, Roger. And thank you, everyone, for participating. And, uh, and also those of you listening or will be listening to the recording. I am Josie Weaver signing off uh, for the Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi and Dr. Roger Yanka. Thank you so much for being here. Bye now.